Hello and welcome to IQ. I'm Pete Dillon. In this program, I want to address the idea of internalised or egodystonic homophobia. Internalised homophobia, as described to me by a medical terminology, refers to homeo homophobia as a prejudice carried by individuals against homosexual manifestations in themselves and in others. It causes severe discomfort with or disapproval of one's own sexual orientation. And the term egodystonic, again, is a, is a medical term referring to behaviours that are in conflict or dissonant with the needs and goals of the ego, or further, in conflict with a person's idea of self-image. In the queer community, it's common to find people that display these types of homophobia not just towards themselves but to others, in particular with race, age, body image, financial status and to those with HIV AIDS. To join me in this fairly technical and uh, I'm sure intelligent discussion tonight, I have journalist, media commentator and broadcaster, Kath Pope. Good evening, Kath. Pete. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good. From the AGMC, and I'll explain that term later, we have Joseph Chikuti. How are you, Joseph? Well, thank you. Performer and all-round nice guy, Simon Stokes. How are you, Simon? <laughs> and wearing two hats tonight as a publisher and editor of a magazine and the president of People Living with HIV AIDS, Brett Hayho. Good evening, Brett. Good day, Pete. How are you? Very well indeed. If we were to take a wander through a gaydar profile, we'd find terms like no fats, no femmes, no Asians, under 30, toned, etc, etc, etc. Many other areas where people are, by choice, excluded from contact. It's the same anywhere in the world. You go to a gay club and there's going to be a sector of, of those people who are the beautiful people, who pay little heed to those that don't fit their own stereotypes. Sex on premises venues are another area where this sort of rejection and homophobia owing to physical appearance can challenge a people. I'd like to start with the AGMC, which is the Australian Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, Intersex and Queer Multicultural Council. It represents people across our community from some 34 cultures. Joseph, I'd like to ask you how you react to racial discrimination against homosexual people by homosexual people. Well, if I look at it personally, I have been trying to think of an instance uh, when I was discriminated within the gay community, and I use that to cover uh, the broader community, uh, on the basis of my ethnicity, and I, I can't come up with a single instance. And I've been involved in the gay scene since the early 1970s, uh, in terms of how gay men, lesbians, uh, transgender, people react to discrimination, I imagine the first reaction uh, would be by sort of getting together and trying to create a support group. However, I think I want to draw a distinction between discrimination, which is treating someone unfairly and unfavorably with erotic attraction. I think it's important when we talk about these things, we distinguish between both. Uh, a person has a right to his or her erotic attraction. I think it would be a very dangerous society if we start programming people to, be, to become politically correct in that regard. However, that does not mean that on the pretext of their erotic attraction, people should behave in a discriminatory manner. For example, uh, if a person wants or is after a group of people within a particular age bracket, he or she should be able to say that without necessarily de denigrating others who do not fall within that category. And I was going to move to you, Brent. You edit and publish Q magazine. It's a glossy A5 national magazine. From your perspective of an organisation that relies heavily on advertising, um, we see a focus in advertising in the queer press of beautiful bodies and um, different services for maintaining those beautiful bodies. Are they damaging to those that can't achieve it? can't achieve that beautiful body by virtue of being big boned or, or uh, a, a genetic disposition to being large or tall or um, you know unable to to have that that sort of very stereotypical beautiful body okay for starters there there's always in publishing a, a commercial reality mm -hmm. so having ads in a free publication obviously pays for that publication the content of those ads I don't know that publishers have a right particularly to tell advertisers what images to put in there. How that, how that affects the people reading the magazine, I, I really don't know. I, I, I think you'd have to be reasonably shallow, quite frankly, if you took, a, if you took offense to, a, to an image in an advertisement, unless it was about that particular thing. The, the other question that came up just before um, when we were here was, 
um, seen pictures mm -hmm. in publications. Now again, um, obviously for, for Q Magazine, it's a smaller publication in, in size than the, than the street press. Um, they have a lot more room. However, um, I know because I take the photos um, that I am always conscious of taking not only twinks, and I do take twink mm -hmm. pictures. Um, however, I do go to establishments where there are leather clad gentlemen, older men. Mm -hmm. um, that also goes to, to establishments that, uh, that generally attract Asian crowds more than anybody mm -hmm. else. Um, and I know that I'm personally very conscious to take photos across the board, a whole range of different people, young, old, ethnicity. A responsible publisher. Kath, I'd like to move on to you. You've, you've been around the media for a long time, both in the queer media and straight media. We hear a lot and we read a lot about discrimination that comes from outside of our community. Sure. Why don't we hear as much about discrimination from within our own community? Well, I feel that that's sort of some, it's in, in some respects, it's sort of a dirty little secret. Um, and, and, you know, to, to be a community that's constantly under siege from the wider community, which um, whether it be the government or, or the mainstream community, or religious right, etc. Um, so we're the, vi we're the victims, and, and you know, I don't use that, that term lightly, of that kind of discrimination on a daily basis. For us to then discriminate within our, our own community um, is, is really intolerable from, from my point of view. I think um, there is a, a hierarchy within the, the GLBTI community. Um, I think gay men, in, and I'm, I'm generalising, mm -hmm. I think gay men are generally at the, the top of that pecking order, they're the ceiling. I think um, many people within the transgender community would feel that they um, are really lower in that hierarchy and, and, and are discriminated upon by um, a lot of people within the gay um, and lesbian community. I think they, they probably are um, a part of our community that feel the least understood and, 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 and ridiculed, etc., etc. So um, I don't think there's enough. Um, I don't think there's enough being done within our community and, and within the media, uh, within our community, uh, let alone the, the wider media, the mainstream media, to to address this issue. Sure, Simon. Just going to that dirty little secret that we don't hear a lot about, and and Kath talking about a, a hierarchy. You're a performer, you've relayed to me in conversation that um, you've been discriminated against by other people for, for certain reasons. Do you want to share one of those experiences perhaps, or, or talk about the discrimination that you have suffered from within our community? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, I think it's very much on a body image thing. I find that a lot of people get so hung up with the physicality and the way that people look, they never actually look any further into the inner well, in a beauty, I suppose. It's all based on physicality. Um, <laughs> I've had instances where people have come up to me and said to me, you need to lose weight, have you called Jenny yet? Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm always amazed that people think they have the right to say that kind of thing. And it's sort of really quite hurtful, you know. Um, and I'm, I just am astounded that people think they have the right. I think that at the end of the day, we should be concentrating on you know, getting to know each other and understanding each other and showing some tolerance and not judging each other. Unfortunately, it seems to be very much of like, physically, if I find you attractive, then I will show you some courtesy, I'll talk to you, I'll even acknowledge you. Um, yeah, so. Tolerance is an interesting word. We, mm. we demand tolerance from the broader community to embrace our sexuality as we have. Um, we tend not to do it ourselves. I had a recent discussion with a with a young openly gay, um, sorry, openly HIP positive uh, drag queen, who also suffers a bipolar condition. Um, he has his finances or his, his pension managed by an organisation, um, and he said he's, he's just he's, he suffers from discrimination across so many levels in the community, um, and and really struggles with that, and it, it affects his his mental con condition. Brett, I want to bring you back in here wearing your PWLHA. PLWHA. Uh, even PLWHA. Yeah, 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 I'm really bad with these, <laughs> these anagrams. Um, Somebody once said that it stood for people living with a hundred acronyms. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty close. 
from a perspective of, from your organisation with dealing with people who have HIV AIDS, there, there exists again within the community a lot of discrimination towards HIV positive people. Is that a fair statement? Look, there certainly is. It is a very fair statement. It isn't a fair reaction, however. Mm. Um, you'll also find, and this has come up in conversation with a lot of forums and a lot of groups, uh, a, a, a lot of conferences that I attend, and it tends to be, strangely enough, more in Melbourne than it is in Sydney, for example. Mm -hmm. um, probably because Sydney has been bombarded with HIV from the early 80s, and a lot of people are living with HIV AIDS in that community, and they talk about it. The, the biggest thing to in, in my mind, to lower that discrimination, particularly in the HIV community, is to talk about HIV. Mm. Whilst, that whilst that conversation is occurring, people can't help but to understand it, to, to then learn, to, to grow that knowledge about the virus, and that you cannot contract HIV from talking to somebody. Or drinking from the same cup. Or, or, as, our, or as our moron health minister once said in a group of very high up people in the HIV sector, is it true that you can't get this from a coffee cup? Believe it or not, that was our health minister. It takes us back to the start of the, the epidemic in, in the 80s where oh, it certainly does. Those, those perceptions were there. I'd like to just touch on um, the work of an author by the name of uh, Andrew Sullivan. He's a gay man. He's quite conservative in, in his approach. Um, he seems to think that this stems from our childhood, and there's a couple of quotes I've got here. His book, Virtually Normal, um, in that book he writes that every homosexual child will learn the rituals of deceit, impersonation and appearance, and the isolation will always hold its definitional of homosexual development. So I guess what he's saying is that, that the gay or lesbian teenager learns a form of self-control, sublimation, deception and, and to some extent self-contempt that never really leaves the consciousness. And I wonder if that then um, continues on to, to our adulthood where things that we try to suppress, I guess, as, as our sexuality and our, our adolescence was developing, whether we're starting to, to pop this onto other people. I tend to agree. I tend to think that most things that people don't particularly like in other people, it's something within themselves that they're not comfortable with. Um, so I do tend to agree. I think that, you know, from personal experience, I know that when I was younger, I had um, a lot of trouble dealing with the fact of people who were effeminate because as being a, you know, when you're going through that stage of coming out, you don't want to be seen as being gay, so you try to be more butch, but people who are really effeminate and, and sort of really show it, you just go, oh God, I don't want to be like that. So you end up separating yourself from those kind of people going, I don't want to associate with them sure. because people will think that of me. And then the really funny thing is you just end up being a screaming queen later on down the track <laughs> because you get comfortable with it and you go, you know what, what was I worried about? Mm -hmm. So as soon as, you can, well, as soon as you can accept it within yourself, then you can accept other people. And I do think that a lot of people out there have certain issues within who they are that they put up barriers and as soon as they become comfortable and are happy with who they are, the barriers drop. Mm. So I'd Some people will never, never actually find that comfort either, Joseph. Yeah, I, I think we've got to be very careful though. Uh, we must not move from issues of discrimination into issues of abnormal psychiatry because we've got to bear in mind that before 1973, it was the profession of psychiatry that labelled us as basically sick. Mm -hmm. My concern is that if we start putting medical labels to what are really, or what is really nothing else but acts of discrimination, what we will be doing is letting psychiatry back into our bedroom through the back door. But, but, but Joseph, but, don't you feel sorry. as, um, I guess, um, as a as a, a lesbian, um, or you know, I, I, I think you know, whatever age you begin to mature with the feelings you're having and understand your sexuality and develop. Um, but, but for most children, they just want to be the same as any other kid. I mean, that's, it's, it's all about being the same. A child does not want to be different, um, generally speaking, from, from the, the, the norm, the group, the pack. And I think those, you know, for, from a, as we grow up in an early age, 10, 11, 12, when these feelings perhaps later, perhaps earlier, begin to awaken within us, 
that sense of being different is is and as uh, Simon sort of discussed, immediately we react to that and we, we, we don't want to be different, so we, uh, we are already wearing masks and, 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 and suppressing feelings and, 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 and having negative self-esteem issues. And quite often you'll find parents, I mean, I, I'd be, I think it's a rare, can, a rare example, aside from perhaps gay and lesbian parents, for parents to be happy and encouraging of a child who's exhibiting um, tendencies uh, towards homosexuality at an early age. I think the parent, out of fear, out of um, you know what that child might have to face, uh, ex out of their own fears, etc., is going to try and, and suppress those feelings from a very early age. You know, I'm not denying that there are pressures. I'm not denying that there is homophobia. But what I am saying is we've got to be careful, you know, going that extra mile and saying that these are conditions that are really a matter for psychiatry to, to deal with. That's my concern. Sure. But I think when, when people are on the receiving end of, of discrimination from within their community, and, and I've suffered it on numerous occasions as well, you, you, it does then have a, an ongoing almost psych psych or psychological effect to the way you perceive yourself. And by that then turning around, it, it becomes um, a pathology of the, of the way you perceive others because you learn to dislike those things about yourself. Put simply, how many heterosexuals do you know who are conscious of their heterosexuality? Whereas, as, as aside from being uh, in, a, in a gay bar seeing um, a village people review, let's put that aside for a moment, they're not. Whereas how many gay and, and lesbian, transgendered, bisexual, you know, the whole spectrum of our community, our members are conscious of, of their um, sexuality every day. Well, well I'm Most certainly not denying the fact that uh, there is discrimination in our society against people you know, who are members of sexual minorities, nor am I denying the fact that uh, this discrimination uh, affects members of se sexual minorities adversely. What I am really saying is this, that we must not immediately jump and give certain conditions medical labels because what we may be dealing with may simply be instances of discrimination I mean you know sometimes for example in my case uh, some people for example regard me as old uh, now I really don't think of myself I mean I don't think of myself as old but but it depends on the perspective that you take I mean I as I said I came up in the 1970s a lot of the gay men that I knew then are no longer with us. But I don't, like, sorry, I just tend to think that there's no point in trying to analyse it and put a label on it, actually do something about the problem. You know, I, I sort of agree. Instead of trying to say there's a psycho psychological name before this and we need to name it to understand it, just turn around and change the behaviours. Have people aware of what they're doing. You know, as, as gay people, we don't want to be um, discriminated against so don't discriminate others when we come out we're fearful that we're going to be rejected by our parents and our family and by our loved ones and yet within our own community yes. we're rejecting each other because we look at people and we go well you're not the norm and you don't look the magazine man I want to see or maybe you're a different color to me or maybe you think a bit differently or, or you dress differently you know people aren't actually looking at people as individuals and going wow, let's have a conversation. Maybe I like this person, I like the way they think. It's purely on different kinds of... Um, it, it becomes very much a physical thing. Yeah, certainly we, <laughs> certainly we can't get... Ex certainly we cannot ask or expect acceptance and tolerance from the broader community unless we accept and exactly. tolerate ourselves. Yeah, yeah. However, is that not systemic? Is it not something that is not specific to the gay community, but human beings in yeah, but general? A, a, that aside, regardless, we have a responsibility to conduct ourselves as decent people. We need to show respect to each other, because if we want respect, we have to put it out there. If we want to be tolerant and have people who are tolerant of us, we need to do it. It's about old-fashioned totally values. Agree. It's totally about agree. changing our behaviours and making everyone in the, in the gay scene wake up. It's like if you don't like being someone turn around and say something nasty to you, then you don't say it to other people. It's common sense. And unfortunately, I find that so many people are so self-obsessed by, oh my God, do I look good? Am I going to pick up? Does this man like me? They don't actually 
or they're not aware of their behaviour and how they're treating other people. Um, I just want to sort of perhaps sneak across to popular culture because there is, um, has always been a portrayal in popular culture going back as many years as I can research that portray homosexuals as, as treacherous, as effeminate, as weak, as sexually compulsive and preternaturally sad. And, you know, find me a film up to about the last three or four years that was commercially released or a television program that actually showed a, a, a real gay person that doesn't subscribe to all of these stereotypes around age, around race, around, um, you know, body image. I've never seen um, correctly portrayed a large aged Asian homosexual. You mean we're not all hairdressers? <laughs> we're not all hairdressers, no. we're not all our interior designers. But don't you think though that we actually project that ourselves as well as part that, that, of the That's community. what I'm asking, so, you know, is it you know, is it up to us to start changing it those is. stereotypes? That is changing, it, 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 it is. but it is changing mm. slowly. Um, uh, you know, certainly the Will and Grace uh, character portrayal, but you know, um, there are programs that are getting funding that are, are, are really doing everything they can to push that envelope. Um, an example on our, our screens in Australia at the moment is the miniseries um, that's probably just aired, finished, um, The Circuit on SBS, which portrays um, an Indigenous stockman in the Northern Territory having a relationship with a white urban male. So there's a cross-racial, indigenous, um, you know, we, we tick a lot of boxes with that relationship and it's being portrayed in a 9.30 time slot on a Sunday night. I'm not sure sorry. whether I should have told you uh, that sorry, time on, slot. But on, on the SBS. Are on we going to see this yeah. on Channel 10 or Channel 9? I think it's just finished, but there is a show on a, a was on a Monday night on 7 called Brothers and Sisters. Now oh, there is a Brilliant. Now there is a gay character in there. Who now is there's dysfunctional. So mm. I, I just want to question that representation that that maybe it's still fitting very much within a small minority of our community that 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 you know it doesn't tackle he doesn't have a, a, a partner of a different race he doesn't have an older a larger uh, you know any of those things that I'm talking I about. I think that's changing, Pete. I think um, the are you being served model of of um, <laughs> I'm free <laughs> homosexual representation on TV screens. Um, it, it's almost like um, in America, you know, the or in our screens too, the, the token role of um, African Americans to sort of the yeah. servant mm. kind yeah. of thing. That that's reprehensible to represent that in a modern program, unless you're making a point um, by yeah. by doing that, which which is the story arc of the the discrimination or racism that that person's mm. suffering. But mm. these, I think. For a, a modern program, it, it's, you know, it generally these kind of stereotypes don't fly in the face of the, the producers and the, and the pitch these yeah. days. I think Look, a better also, character would be Six also Feet Under. The, but, well, let, I yeah. was just about to say, now that, that obviously happened in Six Foot Under, but again, he came from quite a wealthy family. Yes, but he his had partner a, was older, his partner yes, he was had a, African He American. was an interracial mm. relationship, yep. yes. Um, I hate to say it. But, I mean, isn't it baby steps as well? I mean, for, for many, 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 many years, we've had uh, only tokenism mm. on commercial television particularly. Finally, we're coming up, we've just named two programs for starters, where they weren't token, mm. they were part of the storyline and in a very real way. Maybe it's baby steps. I mean, maybe that the but next it, step then for, for commercial television producers is to add an overweight, aged... But then do you really want to be... Like, you know, I mean, television is, is basically about entertainment. Mm. Once you start getting into these issues, mm. don't you think that, that people are going to go, oh, God, I don't want to know about it? We've got to bear in mind where we came from. The first kiss by two gay men on TV took place in Australia in 1972. It was by Peter Bonsall Boone and Peter Duane. Um, number 96. No, 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 no. Yeah. that was, uh, that, 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 this was a real kiss. They were being interviewed, a right. real gay couple. Peter Blasey in 1978 had a struggle to try and put an article on homosexuality in, I think it was the Australian. So we've come a long way. We, we don't live in a perfect way, world, but I think Australia has made 
you know, quite a number of achievements in terms of our rights. But that, I, I, I just have to sort of say that, you know, that's, that's, I think, a very small journey in 30 odd years, given the way the, the rest of the world is changing and opening up. But we were invisible for centuries before it. Guys, we have to wrap up. Kath Pope, thanks again for your time on IQ. No Simon, thank you for joining us and being so candid. Brett, again, thank you. My and pleasure, Joseph, thank, thank you. you. This has been IQ. We'll see you next time. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.